at Family Church, we celebrate the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus uh, all the time. But once a month, we, we celebrate using the Lord's Supper and communion. And if you're watching us regularly online, I think it'd be a great idea if you would have a cracker and juice or if you'd have some way that you can celebrate with us so that in the service time when we actually have communion, you can share that with us wherever you are. I hope you can do that today. We're in the middle of a sermon series called Exponential where we are looking at the book of Acts and as we're doing that, we are trying to come around with this idea. What would it look like if our lives were more than just living about ourselves? but we were living for the impact of others. And we're going to be in Acts chapter 15 today, so you can turn to Acts 15 right now. So, there's an interesting thing about life. Have you noticed how we often end up having conflict with people? Raise your hand if you've had conflict with someone in the last month. Good. If you have multiple hands up, I understand that. Let's stop and pray right now. For Raise your hand if you have had conflict in the last week. Raise your hand if you fought with your spouse on the way here. Don't, don't put your hand up. That was a total trick you are in. That's not going to go well for you. So here's what's so funny. Today we're going to be talking about conflict, and I know what you're thinking. Why would we talk about conflict at church? Church is the one place where there should never be conflict. Because God is love. And the people that go to church love him. So they should never, ever have a fight at church. <laughs> yeah. Raise your hand if you've ever been hurt at a church. Yeah. You know, what's an interesting heartbreaking part about that is oftentimes this is a place where conflict rises up the most. And one of the reasons for that is conflict at its core is quite simply when two people value different things. I value one thing and you value another. I remember when I was 18 years old, there was a discussion on whether or not I should become someone who led worship at that church, be the worship leader. It was a small paying thing. And uh, my father was the pastor. And at that church, the way that it functioned is there would be a business meeting to make decisions and everyone had an equal vote. And usually there were about 20 people at a business meeting. This time, there was a big issue because there was some young 18-year-old that might start leading worship there, and that could be a problem. So 65 people showed up. 30 of them I had never seen in my life. But they were still members of that church, and so they were free to come. And so the people that were opposed to it called them up and said, we need your help. We have to save the church. <laughs> and so they came, and in one of those brutal meetings that I had the privilege of being a part of, I watched Conflict. Handled poorly. Interesting little thing about that is if you look at conflict throughout the, uh, the church, a lot of times it had to do with music. In fact, I, I, let me show you this. This is the top 10 reasons why we shouldn't play new music at church. Number one, it's like a different language. Number two, it's not melodious like traditional music. Number three, there are too many new songs to learn. Number four, it causes people to act in indecent or disorderly manner. Number five, it places too much emphasis on the instruments rather than godly lyrics. Number six, lyrics are worldly and blasphemous. Number seven, it is unnecessary as, as previous generations have been reached without it. Other people came to Christ for the last few hundred years and they didn't need this music. Why have new music? Number eight, it is a contrivance just to get money. Number nine, it encourages Christians to stay out late. I don't, I don't get that one either. And number 10, the new musicians are often lewd or loose persons, and the other part of that is that they're often young, upstart people. Here's an interesting thing about that list. It was written in 1723. <laughs> and it was written in opposition to hymns because hymns were written with the melodies of bars. They were written with new heart music. And so, you know, the main person it was standing against in England... It was against Isaac Watts, who wrote 600 of the hymns that I grew up with. When I survey the wondrous cross, joy to the world and my absolute favorite at the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight and now I'm happy all the day. That's not okay. <laughs> because the lyrics are lewd, because this is not about Jesus, because they're trying to make money. This is a conflict that has been in the church for generations upon generations, and it's quite simple. Some people value some things, and some people value others, and the church way to handle that is to fight. Raise your hand if you like some of the songs we sing. Raise your hand if you don't care for some of the songs we sing. 
Raise your hand if you think we all agree on which ones those are. Yeah, that's what I thought. So now we are set. And here's my question. Can we disagree without being divisive? Can we contend without being contentious? We say yes. And yet conflict is always waiting. Then why did you raise your hand if over the last month that you've had a conflict? You see, as we look at Acts 15 today, we're going to look at how the church handled conflict. But I want us to pull that out and say, yes, that's how we should handle conflict 2,000 years ago in a church. And it's how we should handle conflict in a church today. But more than that, it's how we handle conflict sitting in the car when you can't stand the person you married. And I know that happens. And don't think I don't, yeah. It has to change the way we perceive this. So in Acts 15, we're going to be looking at um, some key characters. I want to give you a little background for them. Um, by the way, this is my good friend, Isaac Watts, who wrote the great hymns of my childhood. This is the guy they were standing in opposition to. So uh, some of the characters from Acts 15. Uh, first is Peter. Peter was one of the main disciples when Jesus was on earth, and he's been a key leader for the church. Now on the timeline here, the story today takes place about 20 years after Jesus. So the church has been around for only about 20 years. Peter is one of the key leaders. Uh, in that, he's probably the most famous of all of them. The next one is Paul. Paul is uh, the guy who was originally the enemy of the church, wanted to destroy the church, and Jesus said, hey, I got an idea. Why don't you join my team? And, and Paul said yes, and he became one of the main missionaries to other places outside of Israel. He's going to be really key in this. And then there's another guy named James. Now, a little clarity for you. A few weeks ago, we talked about uh, the follower of Jesus named James who was executed. He was a close disciple of Jesus. This is not that guy. This is the half-brother of Jesus. James's mom is Mary. James's dad is Joseph. He is now the key leader in Jerusalem. We don't use this term, but he would be like the bishop of Jerusalem. That church really was under the authority of him. And then another group called the Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees, if you're reading the stories of Jesus, were always fighting against him. But one of the great miracles in the Bible that we often run right over is 20 years later... A whole bunch of them have become followers of Jesus. Stop and pause for a moment. 20 years later, these people who were so adamantly opposed to the movement of what Jesus was doing are now followers of him. But they're going to be a key component in this. We also have a couple, call them vocab words. We want, you to make, we want to make sure that if you come to church and you don't have any background in the Bible, there, if there's words that we don't use in everyday 21st century life, that we tell you what they are. One of them is a Gentile. Gentile is a non-Jewish person. It's anyone in the world who isn't Jewish. So a little test here. Raise your hand if you are a Gentile. That's pretty common in Southern Oregon. Green, South Umpqua, Sutherland. For the most part, we're Gentiles, which means this story that we're doing today means a lot to you. Especially if you are a male. Because my next vocab word is called circumcision. And a little vocab for you here. Uh, boy, I tell you, there are moments when you're on stage and it feels a little bit awkward. This is one of them. So I'm going to try and give you a definition. If you don't understand it, ask your mom and dad. It's a Jewish custom from Abraham all the way through where they would do a small surgery on the part of the male body that makes that male male. Yes, I got that right, okay? Okay. So on the eighth day of that young boy's life, they would do a small surgery on the part of him that makes him him, and then that would make him Jewish. The reason for this, it was a mark that said, we are followers of God. And this was the history of the Jewish people. Okay, we're following along with that. Last night when we were having this dialogue, I, I got so excited, I said that it happened on the eighth year instead of the eighth day. And I was like, well, happy birthday, son. You're eight now. Come on in. Whoa, I did. Yeah, it's the eighth day, which is cool because the kid doesn't remember it, right? I mean, of, of all the time to do a small surgery, do it then. Well, as you look at this uh, in terms of the course of their history, this is what had always happened. Well, this becomes an issue. The reason it was such an important mark is because it was marking the reproductive part of the male that says, this seed that you're carrying carries on throughout. Well, now watch this. As we talk about circumcision, when you become a follower of Jesus, here's the ultimate question. To become a follower of Jesus, do you also need to become Jewish? 
Okay, so when we've picked this up in um, Acts chapter 15, this is where we're going to be. Because in the church in Antioch, which is north of Jerusalem, we have some people that come in from Judea, and they're preaching something that's a little scary for everyone that's a dude. Here's what they say. Unless, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. Well, this put the whole church in Antioch in distress because it's made up mostly of Gentile people. Everyone in there says, whoa, hold on. There's two reasons this is tenacious. One of them is because every male going, hey, hold on, say what? <laughs> the secondary part is because this is the foundation of what it means to be a follower. Because if it means this, that you admit you're a sinner, you believe that Jesus rose and died, or died and rose again, you have to get that in the right order. He died and rose again for our sins and that you give your life to him. If that's what it takes to be a follower, then this isn't true. It takes A, admit, B, believe, C, commit, and S, surgery. It's something a little bit more. This is, if you remember the Sola series we did last summer, and we said it's Jesus alone, it's, it's Christ alone, it's grace alone, this is in direct opposition to that. And when this happens, some people start sweating. Paul and Barnabas say, this is not okay. And so they stand up and say, we have got to deal with this issue. They had offered Jerusalem to pull all of the church together and say, we need to have a conversation. All the elders from the churches, we need to gather, and they're going to have a council. So when they show up in Jerusalem, sure enough, there are other people that agree with these guys. Um, Paul called them Judaizers, the idea that everyone would need to become Jewish. And this is what it says in 5. Some of the believers who belong to the party of the Pharisees just pause there and say, this is a miracle, and just embrace this. People who hated Jesus are now followers of Jesus. But they stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. And I have to say, coming from 21st century, we see this and go, no, because I've read the end of the story. No, no, no. Stop and pause for a moment. From the moment of Abraham, through Isaac and his son Jacob, Jacob has his name changed to Israel. He has 12 sons, and they become the 12 tribes of Israel. And for thousands of years, this is how God worked. It was through the nation of Israel. Jesus comes as a Jewish man. He has 12 disciples that are Jewish men. It makes perfect sense that this would continue on, that when Jesus rose from the dead, part of being a follower of Jesus would also mean to be Jewish. You can, I, this makes sense to me. I can see how they got here. But oh, the beauty of making sure that it's admit, believe, and commit, and there's nothing added because it's by grace alone. It's by Christ alone. And so the first person to stand up and say, I have a problem with this was Peter. And Peter stood up, and this is what, what he did. The apostles and elders, they met together for this question. I want you to notice this carefully. When you're looking at conflict, look at how they did it. They met together. They didn't talk behind each other's back. They didn't post anything on Facebook. They didn't post anything on Twitter. They met together to consider the question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Now, I want you to know a little something about Peter. A couple weeks ago, Paul told a story about how Peter had been really challenged by God, and he stepped into a relationship with a guy named Cornelius, and he led Cornelius to a relationship with Jesus. He was a Gentile. Peter's got a background in connecting with the Gentiles. And here's what he says. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice um, uh, among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. Hey, remember what happened back in chapter 10? Do you remember that? We know that God's called to the Gentiles. Okay, so a little background for you on that. And then he says this in 10. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to keep? Little, little background. If you go back to Moses, remember Charlton Heston? Okay, back when Charlton Heston slash Moses was in Egypt, leading the children of Israel out of Egypt, that generation, the entire generation leaving Egypt did not circumcise their kids. That whole, you would think of all the leaders in Israel's history that would have done it right. Moses, he's one of the great leaders. He didn't do it. All of them didn't. In fact, when, he, when Moses dies and that generation dies, the next generation... Joshua's now in charge. The first thing they do before they attack is they circumcise everybody. Because this is true. Peter's saying, look at our history. You've got to be kidding me. You're going to put this on them? We don't even live up to that. Come on. And then the next move, though, it's not just about history. It's not because there's a bad example before us. Listen to what Peter says. And you've got to love it when Pete has a one-word sentence with an exclamation point. No, and I'm, I'm thinking, I can't, it doesn't say it, but I think he hit something. You know, no! I didn't, did he have a podium? I don't know, but man, 
adamantly, no, we believe it is through what? It is by grace that we have been saved through our Lord Jesus Christ that we are saved just as they are. If that's the case, there is no point in this. Well, after that, Peter sits down and Paul gets up. Well, Paul's history and background is he's going out to all the churches that are full of Gentiles. He's closely connected with them. He hasn't been stuck on the, in the inside of the church where it's all insulated, where all he's around are Jewish people. He's around them all the time. And here's what he says. They come to Christ. You know what we see immediately? The Holy Spirit moving in their life. If you have to have this surgery before you're really saved, then why is God already moving in their hearts? They're being transformed. There are signs happening in the way that they're responding to the world. There is no way. And so Paul says that. And then here's what gets really interesting is who follows that? Remember how I said another character named James? James doesn't have a background with the Gentiles. We, or we don't see any. There's no indication that he's ever in any, at any point had a, even a conversation with one. Well, Peter did. Paul did. Well, he's the leader inside Jerusalem. He's the, the bishop of that church. And as he's the leader of that, watch what he does. We don't know if he came in with any preconceived ideas. We don't know if his background played a part in this. But look what he says here. This is in verse 19. It is my judgment. And it, when it says my judgment, our guess is that he made up his mind at this meeting. He was listening. He was weighing both sides. He sees the Jewish background. And I feel like he probably says, I see it too. God's always worked through the, the through Jewish people. And here we have Peter standing up, though, and Paul standing up. And something's different. He says, It's my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. And so they say, We're going to do two things. One, let's look at um, the prophets. And so if you look at the book of Amos, which is an Old Testament prophet, in chapter 12, it points out the fact that there would be Gentiles who would come into following God because of Jesus. And he says, It's true in Old, Test Old Testament scripture. And then he says this, let's send them a letter and tell them three things to watch out for. And this isn't an all, all comprehensive list, but three keys for them. Number one is they need to stay away from the idols. Anything having to do with other gods and worshiping other gods, cut it. Just don't do that. Number two is they're supposed to abstain from anything sexual that is outside of marriage. That sexuality is for a husband and a wife inside marriage, not before, not outside of that. That's the purpose of, of sexuality. This makes sense. Then number three, it just gets weird. He gives two things about what they eat. Number one, don't drink blood. Thank you for that. That's disgusting. And then uh, number two is don't eat meat from strangled animals. And that's what they send them. That's, they say, don't worry about getting circumcised, but watch out for these three things. And as I look at the way that they handle this, I'm fascinated at how simply and how important conflict is. Raise your hand if you would love it if we never had conflict again. Green Campus, you too. Wouldn't that be wonderful? It'd be peaceful? But here's what's interesting about it. I actually think it has incredibly high value if you're willing to be a part of it. The first thing I want you to see is that conflict sometimes comes from within. We're on chapter 15 of the book of Acts. And prior to this, a lot of the time when there's conflict, it's because someone outside is trying to destroy the church. But you know, this story has no character, not one character that's not already in the church. There's no one from the line of Herod the Roman Empire is not knocking at their door. No one's being dragged out and stoned or crucified. It's all just them. And yet there's still conflict. Why? Because conflict reveals a difference in values. But it's so important to realize that conflict within the marriage is exactly what can actually breathe new life into the marriage and allow for greater intimacy because what happens in the conversation is when you allow conflict to be real and healthy, what can happen is you will understand your spouse more. You will understand the other people in your church more. You will understand your neighbor more or you'll just get bitter. But if conflict is done in a healthy manner, in an open manner, it changes everything. So as I was looking at this, I was thinking about this. There are some people in the room, when I say the word conflict, you have multiple ways that you respond. Some of you in the room, I say conflict and, and imagine you're in it and you immediately want to just go back somewhere and hide. Just. And on the other hand, you have that other person who is a conflict looking for a place to happen. We see you on Facebook. We're well aware of who you are. Uh, every post is about something angry and then in response to anyone who comments, in opposition to that. What I find interesting is usually the avoider and the fighter marry each other. One of them's locked in the bathroom, the other one's, come out, I'm trying to talk to you. I love you. Get out here so we can talk. Yeah, that's going to happen. Yeah, that's why they have locks on the bathroom door, by the way. 
<laughs> it's not privacy. It's quite simply, I'm having a fight, and I want you to a private place. Here's what I want you to see. Uh, for some of you, the idea of a conflict is something that you're not willing to be a part of. There's no healthy part of a conversation, no healthy conflict, if you can't have the conflict. If every time there's something to discuss, you're not willing to. So the first thing I want to challenge you is, are you willing to have the talk? This is really where that question is, can we be in disagreement without being divisive? Can we see the world differently? This is another important part of this. Remember that whole idea that I said, raise your hand if you like certain songs and you don't like others? Are you okay with people having a different opinion? Huh. Yeah. But what often happens is when you say you don't like what I like, you're saying you don't like me. Well, that's not what they're saying, but that's how we're taking it. And that puts us in a very precarious situation because here's what it means. I can only have relationship with you if you agree with me. Oh, the joy of loving someone and loving someone deeply when they are completely other than you. In fact, I would say perhaps that's where intimacy, and I don't mean husband-wife intimacy, I mean relationship intimacy really comes is when I can look at you and know that you are different and love you anyway, and you can look at me and know me and know that I don't agree with you and you can love me anyway. Are you willing to have the conversation? And the second part is, are you willing to do it in a healthy way? And maybe I'm leaning in a little bit more to those of you who are a fight looking for a place to happen. Can I just challenge you on what you put on social media? It's really, really hard to lead someone to Jesus when the people on Facebook who claim the name of Jesus are spending all their time ranting and raving about something political. Because the moment you put yourself in that realm, the thing that you're doing is you're making them in opposition to you when all that really matters comes down to this heartbeat. What have they done with Jesus? It's really hard to talk about Jesus with someone when they're mad at you for what you put up politically, which isn't to say you aren't right. I don't really care if you're right, though. I care that they hear about Jesus. And I've devoted my life to try and have a conversation with people, to have relationship with people so that we can say, do you know that you are a sinner? That's bad enough news already. If they agree, disagree with me on the pol political level, it does me no good to try and get to the, the idea that they're a sinner and I want them to hear about the goodness of Jesus Christ. So for those of you who are a fight looking for a place to happen, I want to ask you this question. When you have values, which is what you're espousing on there, which do you value more? Your political view or your heartbeat to lead someone to Jesus? Even if you're right politically, where did it get you? Okay. So for those of you who are a fight looking for a place to happen, there is a healthy manner in which to do it. Did you notice how they related to this? They got together, and in verse 25, when they're sending out the letter, they use these exact words. So we agreed to choose some men. You see this? We agreed. Let me tell you, I bet there are men in that room who did not actually say, I see your point. You have changed the way I see this. But when they left the room, they were in agreement. You know what that's called? It's called submission. A few years ago, we were sitting around as a staff having a discussion on a sermon series that we were going to do. I disagreed with what Ed and Paul and Larry said we should do as a sermon series. I thought they were dead wrong. And I said it to them in the meeting, and we talked about it. And because we we're slow processors and we wanted to continue to make sure that we're all on the same page, we talked about it. I disagreed. We talked about it. I disagreed. We talked about it. I disagreed. And they, and they said, this is the play we're running. And I disagreed. Until we walked out of that room, then we're all in agreement. That's what submission is. It's when you look across the table and say, Ed, you run the play. Paul, you run the play, and I support you. I had my moment to speak about it, but after that, it's called submission. And let me tell you, you never submit if you agree, and you're just in with them. Like, for instance, if at the end of the day, someone yelled out, let's eat donuts, I don't have to submit to that, all right? I agree. Who's with me? Four of us, that sounds about right, looking at the American obesity issue, I'm sure. Okay, that was a little over the top. If someone else said, all right, let's eat cream corn, I'm probably not going to submit to that anyway. <laughs> yeah, that's disgusting. Do you see the difference, though? Submission comes when I don't agree, but I step out and say, I'm on your team. And what you have to do is value relationship more than va value being right. Is it right or relationship that you value most?
So as we move forward, notice that they were willing to have the conflict, and the conflict was within. They were willing to do it, and they were doing it in a healthy manner. The next part about this is that conflict clarifies. Let me give you the basic doctrinal issue that they went with before this. Quite simply this. Jesus is God. He died, and he rose again. Amen. All right, let's go home. That's all they knew. And this issue comes up because there's a problem. And they say, well, we need to clarify. Is it by grace that we've been saved? You know what I don't get? You know when Peter stands up and he says, no, and he gives that exclamation point, and he says, we believe it's through grace, through Jesus Christ that we are saved. Why didn't he just quote Ephesians 2? It says it right there. Because that book hadn't been written for 42 years later, it would come. I actually think that Colossians 2 and Ephesians 2 and actually Galatians 2, they're all written because at this moment, they're wrestling with it. They don't wrestle with it unless there's a problem. You know what I'm noticing? And I'm, I've been thinking and processing this. I have never been the parent of a junior higher. Which means there are conversations my family has not yet had. There are things that we believe that we haven't even talked about yet because we haven't met that part of life. So how will we handle it? In some ways, when the conversation comes because the issue is put in front of us, then we have to have a little conflict that clarifies our stance. I believe this is the moment where it's not just Jesus is God. He rose from the dead and he's what saves us from our sins. Now we have to clarify, is that all it is? Or is there some earning that has to happen in it? So one of the questions I have for you on that is really, do you wrestle well? I was going through a really rough time, uh, senior year of college, had to deal with a breakup with someone, and it was one of those times where my life was in turmoil. I felt like I was twisting. I was at the end of college, which meant I had to pick something I was going to do and where I was going to go, and I ended up moving up to the Douglas County area, and praise God that he called me into this wonderful place I call my home and my community. But at the time, I didn't know how this story ended, and I was in turmoil. And this is what my pastor, Pastor Ryan, said. He said, hey, hey, Will, struggle well. And I said back to him, shut up, you <laughs> jerk. But he said something so profound that it's transformed the way I see when I have to go through something like this. The wrestling is where I understand him more. And this is what I'd say to you. When conflict is done in a healthy manner, it allows for a deeper intimacy because I will know my spouse more. I will know the issue more. I will know more what I believe as I wrestle with it. Wrestle well. One of the things I think you have to have, and, I, and again, I'm inferring this, but when I look at James, I wonder if he wasn't transformed in the process of this, where he would have thought if we were just gonna do a private vote with no discussion, he would have voted that everyone gets circumcised. I feel like he was open, and this is why at the end he says, it is my judgment. He was a part of a wrestling match where he saw something more clearly. The last part of this that I think, I think is really valuable here, it has to do with what you do with the gospel. This good news that we share with people that don't know Jesus, those people that you work with, those people in your home and in your neighborhood that don't know Jesus, is what are you doing to make it hard for them to come to Christ? And how can you avoid that? Because I think there's a real conflict that was avoided. And it had to do with this idea of, is it by grace alone that we are saved? Is this gospel, this good news, really that I'm a sinner and he's died for me? Because ultimately what it would have done, it would have added to it and it would have made it difficult. So I'm picture the Gentile, the family rolls up in the minivan and the dad says, yeah, why don't you guys go on? I'm gonna go fishing. This is more of a price than I want to pay. And so the Jewish people could go to the Gentiles and say, all you need is to submit and give your life to Jesus Christ. But there's another component there. Do you remember those weird things that were, well, the, the, the idea that he said, these are three things I want you to do. And the third one was just weird. Remember, it was stay away from idols. Everyone nods, makes sense. Number two, hey, sex is for a man and a woman inside marriage. Keep it that way. Everyone nods, right? Okay. Then the number three, though, don't drink blood or eat meat that's from a strangled animal. That is just weird. It would be like I'm saying to my kids, hey, I got three rules for you as we're, we're going to um, leave you. Um, hey, clean up your room, all the dirty clothes in the laundry, and no fireworks in the backyard. <laughs> laundry, clean up the room. Fireworks? What is that? Mean? Why? Well, let me tell you, the neighbor on the north side of your house, he was a, a veteran from Afghanistan and Iraq. And when you light those, you will take his heart back there. We're trying to lead this guy to Jesus Christ. Children 
clean up your room, put the laundry away. But above all, do not light fireworks in the backyard. We're trying to lead Jack to Jesus, and that will totally mess with his heart. Don't do it. Remember how I said we want to avoid the conflict that would happen in the heart of a Gentile if they had to be circumcised? Well, here's the thing. A lot of those Gentiles will become followers of Jesus. And wherever they will go, they will find Jewish people. And their job is to lead them to Jesus. And one of the things that will turn those Jewish people off more than anything is if you're drinking blood and if you're eating meat that's been strangled or from an animal that's strangled. Avoid the conflict, no circumcision. Avoid the conflict, don't do anything that's offensive to them. In fact, it even explains this in verse 21. It says, these are the three things, and then it tells you why. The four. Whenever you're reading your Bible, look for two keywords, three keywords. Four, because, and therefore. It will tell you why. It is the why. What, all this thing I just said, don't eat meat that's been strangled. The why. Four. The law of Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. Listen carefully. Wherever you go, you will find Jewish people. Those Jewish people don't know the goodness of Jesus, that he died for their sins, and how desperately wicked they are and how much they need him. Do not eat meat from a strangled animal or you will turn them off. They're everywhere, and your job is to lead them to Christ. Avoid the conflict. So I ask a simple question. When it comes to your relationship with the good news of Jesus Christ, is there anything that you add to it? Now, let me tell you, you may do it without knowing it, okay? I'll give you a simple one for me. One of the things I love about Family Church, from right before I started coming here, they had a separate service. There was a Saturday night service. I was so cool. It meant people that worked on Sundays, they always had a place they could go. It also meant people that enjoy having the Sunday to do other things. Saturday night service was available for them. And our family schedule came into a conflict on Sunday, and we had to go on Saturday night. It was a little bit of a transition for me. And when we got there on Saturday night, it was totally fun. I was totally connected, felt just like church. I mean, in, fact, in fact, the Saturday night service is exactly the same. It's the same sermon. It's the same music. It's the same thing. But when I got up on Sunday morning at about 9.15... I felt so guilty because all my life, on Sunday morning, we were at church. Well, here's what's so fascinating. Is it important that we are connected with other believers and that we're challenged? Is church important? Yes. Did it have to be at 9.15 on Sunday? No. But somewhere in there, it became something that I thought was really important. And as I started letting that go, here's what I realized. That I had added something. In fact, if people that didn't go on Sunday, if I were honest, I was probably a little critical. (laughs) Well, you're not one of the real followers of Jesus. And you'll see that this is the type of thing, without knowing it, this is what you'll do. There are a couple things I really want to challenge you for, but but first, I'm going to release to the Green Campus. I love you guys, and I will see you soon. I love you. So one of those questions that I... um, Well, first, I want to give you a challenge. This idea that we were looking at, um, Peter standing up and yelling, no, it's by grace we've been saved. I want you to have that written in your heart. So I want you to memorize that scripture that he wasn't quoting. But if it had been written, he would have. In fact, I wonder if that that little piece there, Paul was in the room when, when Peter said it. If he's quoting Peter, but it is by grace that we are saved. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says it. It's not by our works so that no one can boast. Mark it in your heart. Write it down, memorize it, put it on there. The other thing is I want to challenge this. Am I wise with my conflict? I want a real heavy evaluation. When I am in disagreement, am I also in discord? When I am in conflict, is it them against me? Or am I open with a loving heart that says, I am here with you and I love you more than our disagreement. I love you more. I don't draw my value that you disagree with me. My identity is in Christ. It's not in what you think versus what I think. You know, uh, I love this idea of saying, we're going to boil this all down to this, that it's by grace that you've been saved. When Jesus Christ was here on earth his last night with his disciples, when they were hanging out, they took an old tradition, much like this idea of circumcision, they took this old tradition and they said uh, of the Passover, and they changed it up and they called it communion. The idea being that when you come back together, I want you to do something to remember that it's only by grace that you're saved. And so there's two little parts of it. There's a a cracker 
and juice. The cracker represents that Jesus' body was broken for us and the juice that his blood was spilled for us. Hey, don't forget, it's nothing else but Jesus and his love and his grace that saves us. And when we submit to him, we win. So as we do this, uh, this is just to be a chance for us to, um, to, to pull that in and remember. So there's a communion down here for us. Um, in fact, all the crackers are gluten-free. I know that's an issue for some people. So um, all of them are gluten-free. Those people in the back, you'll be served. Um, but we want to take some time just to remember that my entire identity is now marked with Jesus, not a surgery. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your gift. A love so deep that you're willing to leave heaven being one with the Father and coming to earth, living through what it took to, to be a baby all the way through the process of life, never once sinning and choosing your own way, but always submitting to the Father. And there you on the cross, you died for us. And three days later, you rose from the dead, all with grace and love. God, I pray right now for us that we would remember that. Lord, I pray for those who are in conflict. In fact, this entire conversation is difficult because there is conflict with them in the church and there is conflict with their history with the church and they haven't dealt with it. There's conflict in their homes and there's conflict in their workplace. God, I pray that you would open our eyes and our hearts to see that our identity is in you and out of that we can have a conversation and not a conflict, that we contend an issue and not be contentious. And we can disagree without being divisive. God, I pray for unity. You said that the mark of the church is whether or not we were unified. Jesus Christ, thank you for your blood and thank you for your body. In your name we pray, amen. Whenever you're ready, you can come up and get communion and go back to your seat and take it whenever you're ready.
shall save me. Jesus came on, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. moment, that wonderful Easter morning when you rose from the dead. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. We're so glad that you're joining us by video, and uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here, and you're uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person, and I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really. And so we just want to say, we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me, or if you'd like to let us know um, that God is using this in your life, that's always encouraging. And we have several of you that that email occasionally. So if you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can uh, give us some feedback, we'd love that. And we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks.